introduce you with the main finding of the report. Finally, uh, the UN Secretary General's Special Advisor on Climate Action, ESG Selvin Hart, uh, should be joining us from New York via Zoom. And of course, then the floor will be open to questions from journalists. We also have with us today Omar Badur, WMO coordinator of the report, who will also be taking questions relating to the report and to the science behind it. Now, uh, let's listen to the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who will give us some insights about this uh, WMO State of the Climate, Global Climate 2021 report. Today's State of the Climate report is a dismal litany of humanity's failure to tackle climate disruption. Sea level rise, ocean heat, greenhouse gas concentrations and ocean acidification set alarming new records in 2021. Global mean sea level increased at more than double the previous rate and is mainly due to accelerating loss of ice mass. Ocean warming also shows a particularly strong increase in the past two decades and is penetrating to ever deeper levels. Much of the ocean experienced at least one strong marine heat wave at some point in 2021. Professor Talas and WMO colleagues will unpack the science, but I will give you the bottom line. The global energy system is broken and bringing us ever closer to climate catastrophe. Fossil fuels are a dead end, environmentally and economically. The war in Ukraine and its immediate effects on energy prices is yet another wake-up call. The only sustainable future is a renewable one. We must end fossil fuel pollution and accelerate the renewable energy transition before we incinerate our only home. Time is running out. To keep 1.5 alive and prevent the worst impacts of the climate crisis, the world must act in this decade. The good news is that the lifeline is right in front of us. Transforming energy systems is low hanging fruit. Renewable energy technologies such as wind and solar are readily available and in most cases cheaper than coal and other fossil fuels. Over the past decade, the cost of wind energy has declined by more than half. The cost of solar energy and batteries has plummeted 85% and investment in renewables creates jobs, three times more jobs than fossil fuels. We don't have a moment to lose. This is why today I am proposing five critical actions to jumpstart the renewable energy transition. First, renewable energy technologies such as battery storage must be treated as essential and freely available global public goods. Removing obstacles to knowledge sharing and technological transfer, including intellectual property constraints, is crucial for a rapid and fair renewable energy transition. Storing renewable electricity is often cited as the greatest barrier to the clean energy transition. I'm therefore calling for a global coalition on battery storage to fast track innovation and deployment. A coalition led and driven by governments, bringing together tech companies, manufacturers and financiers. Second, we must secure, scale up and diversify the supply of critical components and raw materials for renewable energy technologies. Today's supply chains for renewable energy, technology and raw materials are concentrated in a handful of countries. The renewable age cannot flourish until we bridge this vast chasm. This will take concerted international coordination. Governments must invest in skills training, research and innovation and incentives to build supply chains. Third, governments must build frameworks and reform bureaucracies to level the playing field for renewables. In many countries, these systems still favor deadly fossil fuels. We must prevent bottlenecks where gigawatts of renewal projects are held up by red tape, permits and grid connections. I call on governments to fast track and streamline approvals of solar and wind projects modernize grids and set ambitious 1.5 degree aligned renewable energy targets that provide certainty to investors, developers, consumers and producers. Renewable energy policies are fundamental to reduce market risk and drive investment into the sector. Fourth, governments must shift subsidies away from fossil fuels to protect the poor and most vulnerable people and communities. Every minute of every day, coal, oil and gas receive roughly 11 million US dollars in subsidies. Each year, governments around the world pour around half a trillion dollars into artificially lowering the price of fossil fuels, more than triple what renewables receive. 
while people suffer from high prices at the pump, the oil and gas industry is raking in billions from a distorted market. This scandal must stop. Fifth, private and public investments in renewable energy must triple to at least 4 trillion US dollars a year. For solar and wind power, upfront payments account for 80% of lifetime costs. That means big investments now will reap big rewards for years to come. But some developing countries pay seven times more in financing costs than developed countries. We need blended finance that provides the necessary structures to close existing funding gaps and unlock the trillions held by private sector. This means adjusted risk frameworks and more flexibility to scale up renewable finance. The management and shareholders of multilateral development banks and development finance institutions must take responsibility and be held accountable. I call on them, including their private arms, to fully align their entire lending portfolios with the Paris Agreement by 2024 at the latest and to end all high emissions, high pollution finance. This includes using their balance sheets creatively to accelerate the renewable energy transition. And it means selling, setting targets to substantially finance renewable energy infrastructure, including through technical and policy assistance. Commercial banks and all elements of the global financial system need to dramatically scale up investments in renewables as they phase out fossil fuels. Renewables are the only path to real energy security, stable power prices and sustainable employment opportunities. If we act together, the renewable energy transformation can be the peace project of the 21st century. Every country, city and citizen, every financial institution, company and civil society organization has a role to play. But most of all, it's time for leaders, public and private alike, to stop talking about renewables as a distant project of the future. Because without renewables, there can be no future. As today's report makes clear, it's time to jumpstart the renewable energy transition before it is too late. Thank you. Professor Petri Talas, the World Meteorological Organization has been coordinating the work of experts, national meteorological services and UN agencies. What can you say about the report's conclusions? Thank you, Brigitte, and thanks for coming to this uh, event and thanks to Secretary General Guterres for his, uh, his wise uh, words. Uh, WMO is publishing uh, status of climate reports on a regular basis. Uh, typically every spring and, and also before the con climate conferences, uh, the COP meetings, uh, uh, we are also publishing reports and we also publish uh, United in Science reports uh, before the United Nations General Assembly in, in, in New York. And, um, and, and of course, IPCC, which is uh, 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 coordinated by WMO and we have founded it, uh, publishes main big reports uh, uh, we have uh, just published uh, IPCC reports of uh, 3,000 uh, pages uh, during the last uh, months, and, uh, and, uh, and, and there we have the scientific uh, facts uh, concerning climate change. But today we are, we are telling you about uh, the status of climate uh, last year, what is happening in real atmosphere, and, uh, and, and what we have also learned recently is that this uh, war in Ukraine has been shadowing uh, the the, uh, the uh, visibility of uh, of the IPCC reports and um, and and uh, and, and uh, but climate change is still the biggest uh, challenge that we are having having as mankind. In this report, we are showing that we have again broken uh, four records, and, and all, all those records are less uh, less uh, comfortable. Uh, we haven't broken the temperature record. We have seen 1.1 degree warming so far. And that's very much uh, this uh, that we haven't broken the record uh, uh, last year was the fact that we have so-called La Nina, which has been cooling, cooling the Pacific Ocean temperatures. But we have uh, broken temperature records uh, regionally. For example, we broke uh, the European all-time high, 48.8 degrees uh, in southern southern Italy last summer, and also in Canada they broke uh, all-time high. 49.6 uh, degrees uh, in western western Canada, and 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 such uh, records were broken also in Spain and uh, Turkey. But we have broken uh, record in, in in ocean heat, uh, which is more conservative uh, 
uh, than, than the atmospheric temperatures, which are varying according to this uh, ocean temperatures. Uh, so we have uh, now record amount of heat uh, stored in the oceans and, uh, and uh, 90% of the excess heat that we have produced to the planet, uh, they are stored in ocean. And, uh, and then we have uh, broken records in main greenhouse gases, uh, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous uh, oxide. And especially the, the record in carbon dioxide is uh, striking. We haven't seen any, any improvement uh, despite of the, of the lockdowns uh, caused by COVID in 2020. So the concentration still continue growing. We have broken record in, in the sea level rise. Uh, it used to be uh, uh, to about two millimeters per year 20 years ago, but recently we have been uh, we have seen 4.5 millimeters per year sea level rise, rise which is uh, a record uh, so far. And then uh, oceans serve as a sink of, uh, of, uh, of, of carbon dioxide and, uh, and, and, and that means that once we inject more carbon dioxide into seawater, we are changing the chemical composition of uh, seawater, and we have broken record in ocean acidity, which is a long-term threat for several uh, ocean ecosystems like, uh, like corals. Uh, we have seen uh, uh, glacier melting to continue, which is uh, contributing to the sea level rise that I already reported, and especially uh, the Greenland and, uh, and uh, Antarctic glaciers are having major impact on on, on sea level sea level rise and uh, we have also seen uh, this uh, uh, sea ice uh, shrinking continued uh, in the arctic and uh, and also in antarctica and uh, and 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 and, uh, and we have we just reported uh, last week that uh, we there's a 50 percent chance uh, that we would reach the low limit of paris uh, agreement during the coming five years on temporary basis, not on permanent basis, but, uh, but on temporary, temporary basis. And last year we saw several uh, disasters. Uh, the most expensive disaster was uh, Hurricane Ida, which was hitting the United States uh, with 75 uh, billion US dollars uh, losses. Uh, we saw casualties in China, India, Germany and Belgium. Uh, uh, related to flooding events, uh, so those are also possible in developed countries. And in North America, we saw casualties, uh, 600 casualties, uh, which were related to these uh, forest fires and heat waves in 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 USA, Western USA, and Western Western uh, Canada. And then uh, we have seen an increase in the food uh, insecurity, so we have more people suffering of. Uh, hunger, there's a component coming from climate change, uh, there's a component coming from this COVID uh, crisis, and it's, it, there's a high risk now because of the war in Ukraine that we would see, see, see major, major hunger problems. Uh, uh, last year, we, we estimated it's 800 million people globally who are suffering of hunger, and uh, 300, 300, 300, 300 uh, million of them are, are living in, in, um, in Africa. And then uh, what uh, Secretary Zena Guterres has asked us to, uh, to, to, to concentrate on, uh, we know that only uh, half of our members have proper early warning services, and, uh, and Secretary Zena Guterres has requested WMO to, to lead an uh, exercise where we would have 100% coverage of early warning services uh, uh, in coming coming five years. Uh, and we have to invest in the basic observing systems. We have to enhance the early warning service skills at the national level. And also we have to enhance the global water management uh, systems. And we are preparing such a, a proposal for to be approved by the COP27 in Sarmersek uh, this November. And the other major initiative that we are having on, on behalf of WMO is that uh, we would like to enhance the greenhouse gas uh, monitoring system and uh, real-time observation system, uh, what kind of sources of uh, carbon dioxide, uh, methane and nitrous oxide we are having, and how the sinks uh, to ocean uh, uh, vegetation uh, forests uh, uh, function. And uh, there we have uncertainties there, and, uh, and we have ground-based observations, uh, satellite observations, and, uh, 
modeling tools to create such a system and that's that's also something that we are seeking approval for at the COP 2027. But since I'm a former scientist, I would like to prove what I have already said by showing some slides. So in, in, in once I studied physics and mathematics, the basic idea was to demonstrate that this is this is fact. And now I will show you some slides to demonstrate that I didn't just talk, but there are some facts behind. So this is the temperature graph that I already referred to. So we have seen 1.1 degree warming so far. And, uh, and last year, we didn't uh, break uh, all time high because of the La Nina, which was cooling the Pacific, uh, Pacific temperature. But, but as I said, uh, we have broken regional records. And, uh, and, and, and the last seven years period was the warmest uh, seven years uh, since 18, 1850. And, and I already said that we have broken these uh, four, four records, ocean heat, uh, atmospheric uh, greenhouse gas concentrations, carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous uh, oxide. Uh, we have seen recording ocean acidification and sea level rise. And, uh, and, and I will also show you uh, how, how things are proceeding with glaciers, uh, uh, surface temperature, and, uh, and the sea ice extent. Next, please. And this is the this is a story about ocean acidification. As I said, uh, oceans serve as a sink of uh, of carbon dioxide, and uh, and 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 about quarter of the of the emissions of, uh, of carbon dioxide uh, they are taken by oceans. Uh, the other quarter is taken by by forests. And and that now there's an estimation that uh, that we are having uh, most acid uh, uh, sea sea ice uh, water in 26,000 uh, years. And that's a threat for the ecosystems. Then I said that we have seen more than doubling of the sea level rise uh, speed. Uh, uh, in the past, uh, this thermal expansion of the, of the seawater was an important component. But there's a growing component coming of uh, glaciers, especially Greenland and, uh, and uh, Antarctic uh, uh, glacier. Uh, they, they are contributing to that. And uh, here you can see melting of glaciers, uh, uh, which has been speeding up. And, uh, and uh, there are two concerns related to this. Uh, we have more or less lost that game already because of already high concentrations of carbon dioxide. And uh, we expect that the melting of glaciers will continue for the coming hundreds or even thousands of years. Uh, and, uh, and, and that will also have a long-term impact on sea level rise. So the sea level rise game has been uh, lost so far unless we create means to uh, to to, uh, to absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So far, so far we don't have such technological means available, and this is also a long-term threat for the for the availability of fresh water, uh, uh, especially in Asia, where the big rivers of Asia having their origins from from Himalayan uh, glaciers in India. Uh, China, uh, Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, and uh, and here in uh, in in Europe, uh, the Alpine glaciers are also melting. And there's, there's an estimation that uh, by the end of this century, only five percent of the of the Swiss glaciers would be would be would be present, and and that's going to be a, a threat for the for the water availability in the rivers and. Uh, lakes in the Alpine region. The same is true for Andean region and uh, Rocky Mountain region. And this ocean heat, um, as I said, more than 90% of the excess heat that we have produced to the planet uh, by, uh, by uh, emitting especially carbon dioxide, uh, uh, we, we, have, uh, we, we have seen a steady increase of the ocean heat, uh, heat content. And, and this is also contributing to the sea level rise. The, 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 the warmer ocean is uh, thermally expanding. And here are the greenhouse gas concentrations, uh, carbon dioxide, uh, methane, and nitrous oxide. And in carbon uh, dioxide, we have seen almost 150% uh, increase since pre-industrial times. In methane, about 260% uh, increase, and, and nitrous oxide, about 120% 20, 20 uh, uh, increase uh, since the pre-industrial Times. And out of those, uh, carbon dioxide is the biggest uh, problem. It has caused two thirds of the warming and uh, 
its lifetime is very long, and that's that's a, that's our long term challenge, and that's that's very much related to the use of uh, fossil fossil fuels. And here are some recent measurements from uh, from Mauna Loa in Hawaii. Where we have the longest record of uh, of carbon dioxide, and you can see also the steady steady increase and even even uh, increased uh, uh, growth uh, during the recent uh, recent decades. And recently, we have broken also records uh, there. And as I already said, uh, we have seen uh, damages caused by disasters. Uh, Last year, and um, and and uh, we, we just published uh, our 50 years report uh, uh, some months ago, where we demonstrated that we have seen a fivefold increase in the economic losses related to disasters. And and, and last year we got uh, this Hurricane Ida, uh, we got uh, flooding uh, damages in China, Germany, and India, and and this extreme drought and heat waves uh, in Canada, uh, USA, Horn of Africa and uh, several Asian uh, countries and, uh, and, and Latin American countries. And, and this spring, we have seen record amount of, uh, of cyclones hitting Madagascar with uh, severe flooding and, uh, and wind speed related uh, damages. And I already said that this uh, food uh, security is one of the major concerns uh, related to climate change and, uh, and, and that component is uh, Growing, and uh, we have uh, we are threatening uh, the implementation of sustainable development goals in general. We have estimated that 10 out of the 17 sustainable development goals uh, they are sensitive to uh, climate change, and uh, and we all know that we are lagging behind in implementation of the sustainable development goals. And uh, I already mentioned that uh, that the climate component has uh, has uh, had a negative impact on food security. COVID pandemic has also had, and the current war in Ukraine is uh, for sure having a major impact. Uh, for example, 80% of the wheat uh, that is uh, consumed in Africa is coming from, uh, from, from Ukraine or Russia, and, and uh, that's going to be a major, major uh, challenge. So, and, and uh, finally, uh, Secretary General Guterres uh, tasked us to prepare this major early warning service uh, initiative uh, and our aim is to mobilize 1.5 billion US dollars during the coming five years to, 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 to improve the early warning service access, uh, which is a very powerful way to adapt to climate change. You get the money back uh, typically 20-fold by investing in early warning services. And we have major gaps in African countries, uh, Pacific and uh, Caribbean island states. And here you can see that, uh, that only 40% of the of our members have proper multi-hazard early warning services. And it's also important to be, to be able to forecast the impact of weather events, and, and, and that's a way to, to minimize the risks of, uh, of, uh, of, of growing amount of disasters. So uh, 27, which we are preparing uh, uh, as the United Nations, uh, uh, we have had plenty of uh, interaction with the government of uh, Egypt, uh, which is having the presidency of the next uh, COP meeting. And from our side, we will have this early warning service uh, proposal uh, to be approved by COP27, and also this greenhouse gas, better greenhouse gas monitoring system is also one of our initiatives. And from the governments of, of Egypt side, uh, they are paying attention to implementation of the previous uh, pledges, and, and also they will uh, the, the, the desire is to allocate more resources for climate uh, adaptation since the negative trend in climate will continue for the coming decades anyhow and, and this uh, melting of glaciers and uh, sea level rise for the coming centuries. So now I have uh, demonstrated that what I said uh, at the opening is, is a fact and uh, I hope that you believe in those facts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Secretary General. Uh, now we have the pleasure to welcome uh, UN Secretary General's uh, Special Advisor on Climate Action, Assistant Secretary General uh, Selvin Hart. Mr. Hart, you are joining us from New York. It's 4 a.m. in the morning for you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, making it and being with us. You will present uh, further comments on behalf of the UN Secretary General. The floor is yours. 
Thank you so much. Um, and the time is definitely um, not a problem. When uh, Professor Talos um, asked me to show up, I always show up. And I just wish to salute and thank him for his continued leadership and for the leadership and hard work of all of the colleagues at the WMO. Um, we are now officially at the midpoint between COP26 and COP27. And the reality is that the world is not on track to close the gaps on mitigation, on adaptation, and finance, which were acknowledged in Glasgow six months ago. So as we've learned from the report that was just launched by Professor Talos, climate change continues to break new records, and all major climate indicators are quite frankly heading in the wrong direction. And without much, much, much greater action and much greater ambition, much greater urgency, we are about to lose the narrow window of opportunity to keep the 1.5 degree goal of the Paris Agreement alive and thereby protect people and livelihoods from even worse impacts from the climate crisis. So it is also abundantly clear that moving much faster to a renewable energy future is the only way to provide us with an opportunity to keep the 1.5 degree goal alive while simultaneously ensuring energy security and economic growth and creating new and exciting jobs. And this is why the UN Secretary General today has announced these very concrete actions that are urgently needed to jumpstart the renewable energy transition. So allow, allow me to provide some further context very, very briefly. First, we need to make renewable energy technologies a global public good, global public good and a basis for international cooperation and coordination. And while the cost of renewable energy technologies have been falling quickly, um, wind by 55% over the last decade, solar by 85% and battery storage by 85% over the course of the last decade, we really need to um, accelerate the decline of the cost of renewable energy technologies, um, as well as the efficiency, for example, of, of, of battery storage um, to further ensure that we can deploy renewable energy technologies in really, quite frankly, in the places that, that need it most. And this is why on the issue of battery storage, the Secretary General has asked for a coalition led by governments really to ensure that there's much greater international um, uh, coordination around innovation and development of battery storage technologies. Secondly, the Secretary General has asked to um, diversify, ensure much greater diversity of global supply chains around renewable energy technologies. We must urgently ramp up the production of renewable energy technologies um, in every region, in every corner of the globe to ensure that they can be um, rapidly deployed, as I said earlier, in the places that, that need it most. Third, um, and this is really low hanging fruit, all countries need to accelerate domestic legal policy and regulatory reforms to ensure that at a minimum, renewable energy technologies have a level playing field. This includes setting more ambitious national renewable energy targets, reducing red tape and bureaucracy, setting a price on carbon, and streamlining and fast tracking renewable energy projects. Developers, investors, financiers, and ordinary citizens urgently need a high degree of predictability and certainty 
around the production and deployment of renewable energy. On permitting and fast tracking, it takes close to eight years, I've been told, in the European Union for an approval of a wind energy project. In the United States, I'm also told that one has to go through at least um, um, 28 federal agencies. And this is just at the federal level for the approval of a renewable energy um, uh, for some renewable energy projects. And this could take around one decade, 10 years, 10 years. And we don't have 10 years um, in order to, to, to close the important mitigation gaps. This will take 10, so, so fast tracking, permitting and accelerating the rest, domestic policy reforms represent low hanging fruit. Uh, and the Secretary General has also um, called and continued, he continues to call for shifting um, subsidies from fossil fuels to renewable energy, while of course ensuring that there are protection and safe protections and safeguards in place to protect the most vulnerable and the poorest. And fifth and finally is the issue of finance. Finance is the great enabler. And we cannot have this rapid deployment without you know, major shifts in global finance across the finance value chain, public and private finance and finance um, in the multilateral development banks. Um, the cost of borrowing, as the Secretary General indicated, for some developing countries um, is seven times higher than the developed world. And this represents a major obstacle in key parts of the developing world. So as I said at, at the beginning, we are really at this critical moment. We're six months away from COP27 and we're seeing the implications of the war in Ukraine on full in terms of energy prices. We're also seeing many choices being made by many major economies, which quite frankly, have the potential to lock in a high carbon, high polluting future. And will place our climate goals at risk as well as energy security. So the time to jumpstart the renewable energy transition is most certainly now, if not now, then never. Thank you so much.